like mental health check-in should always include tea, but as it is, I only have water and a salty cap. Hi guys, it's Leanne and I am here today with my tops and bottoms for January and also with a mental health check-in. And with much coldness because it's Scotland and it's February and it's awful. So some of you might be new here and might not have seen any of my mental health check-in videos before and it is simply a video wherein I tell you guys how I'm doing with all of my head demons and invite you guys to do the same. The comments are a safe space so if you feel like you want to share how you've been doing recently please do and please feel free to reply to each other. There will be no hate comments permitted. My banny finger is in full limber mode. If you're just here for the books you can skip to this timestamp and you know talk about that stuff. Anybody who's been around my channel for more than a couple of years and it's been here for six years this year I think how did that happen? January is typically not a great month for me. I spend my entire life waiting for autumn to happen. I love fall, I love the colours, I love the weather, I love the leaves and then I love Halloween and then I love the countdown to Christmas and I love winter and I enjoy that entire season because for me it's like it's a big thing, it's not just the one day. Christmas is the month of December. So January is always a bit of a bump back to earth and for my entire life I've kind of tried to figure out a way to make January more fun and like yay for New Year's and there's a tradition in Scotland wherein we you know open the door to let out the old year and welcome in the new and I, I always try and think to myself you know I don't want to do New Year New You but I would like to do like New Year what do we want to achieve this year here's our goals and I managed to do that I managed to do my goals video for the year and I managed to talk about my best books because that was easy right those were the books that I loved to talk about but the rest of January has just been quite pants. I really struggle to get myself back into a routine after Christmas and routines are kind of key for keeping me on track. As soon as I slip out of them I go into like existential crisis mode and my brain starts worrying about all the things that I haven't let it worry about as soon as autumn hits and it's the joyful time. On top of that I have some health concerns that have surfaced in the last little while and you know this is something I've been thinking about quite in depth recently. It's like as I've got older more health concerns have appeared and in this case it's an unknown pain in a place where nobody can really explain why there's a pain and so now there has to be tests and my brain just I don't know about you guys but whenever I have anything that's unexplained in any way my brain just defaults to the worst case scenario in every event and I'm not going to list all of the things that over the last couple of weeks I've thought oh it could be that because I don't want to trigger any of you guys. I do that enough for myself but in amongst my thinking about the way that we don't talk about mental health and we don't talk about the things that worry us for whatever reason we also don't talk about medical anxiety. There's this entire thing where when you're afraid of anything medical or you've been through anything medical and you've been traumatised by it, that the only way to actually get better to recover from the medical thing is to continually re-traumatise yourself by facing that place again, that hospital, that procedure, that drug, that whatever it is. The only way to fix the physical problem is to completely trigger your brain again and again and for people who go through any kind of chronic illness issues that's a really real thing and when my brain has nowhere to put a genuine anxiety I don't know what to do with it even though realistically the only thing that you can actually do is say we'll wait and see even though that is literally the only thing that you can do your brain convinces the rest of you that it's real and that my friends 
is shit. And so in an effort to thwart my brain, I'm going to attempt to do the opposite from January. And instead of sitting in a little ball of anxiety, just being anxious about my anxiousness, I'm gonna try and throw all of that nervous energy into doing all the things. I'm planning to open Patreon in the third week of February, and I am planning a massive shop update for the beginning of March. So I'm, I'm gonna do all of those things, and I'm also I'm gonna do all of the, the booktube things. My plan is to get through the next couple of weeks of waiting and no answers, by not giving my brain a single second to think about that. We'll see if it works. So I hope that you guys have had a much calmer and more productive January, but you know, if you haven't, I say be kind to yourself and give yourself a bit of a break because it's taken me a while to realize that, yep, yeah, I am a mess right now and it's okay. It's fine to be a mess. It's totally fine to be a mess. We do not have to go through our entire lives with all of our shit figured out. I mean, I know I don't. Ever. 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 Hmm. And now it is time for the return of the tops and the bottoms of the month. I haven't done a tops and bottoms video for maybe three months and you guys say that you're really, really missing them. It wasn't that I wasn't reading. It was just that I wasn't always reading that many great books and so I had plenty on the bottom but none for the tops but according to you guys you would like it even if it's just all bombs it's just all bombs I mean I hope I don't have a month like that because that would be really sad but you want it so here it is so we're gonna start with a bottom because man oh man I need to talk about this book specifically I need you guys to tell me why you like it so much because so many of you so many of you love this book and I just, I, d I don't get it. I don't understand it. It is, it's inexplicable to me. So the book that I'm talking about is The Silent Patient. This was the one book that I read in January which wasn't on my TBR at the start of the month where my lovely wife Helen got to torture me with her favourite books. This was one that I read for an episode of my podcast which I host with my lovely friend Kirsty called Death by the Books. You can find links to that down below. And we decided that we were going to read the winner of the Goodreads Choice Awards. If any of you guys have had the misfortune to discuss the Goodreads Choice Awards with me recently, then you will know that I am very much not a fan. It is a screwed up system. I am very dubious about awards anyway, because realistically, who picks them, why, and have you considered the money aspect of the award? Or you support it. But without getting into all of that salty drama, we decided that we were going to put our scepticism aside and we were going to read what won for the top mystery and thriller and that was this one. And quite simply guys, it was trash. There's always the chance that a book that gets really, really, really highly nominated in a sort of public vote situation is going to be a book that's kind of like a thriller for people who don't read thrillers or I don't know a fantasy book for people who don't really read fantasy. It's really not so much a how good is this judgment and more a oh I've read that so I'll vote for it judgment or you know with the Goodreads Choice Awards you could just vote for it without reading it because that's the thing that you're allowed to do. Just saying. And I very, very much think that The Silent Patient fits into that category. I think that it is a book that a lot of people have read and therefore have voted for, as opposed to a book that a lot of people have read and found absolutely no problems with and have loved and it's the next revolutionary thing in the genre. Because, guys, it was just bad. The premise of this one is essentially that a woman who is, oh, she's an artist, can I just... Can I just tell you guys how much I hate the tortured artist trope? Specifically, I hate tortured musicians and tortured painters because the authors spend so much freaking time trying to elicit emotions in you based on a painting or a piece of music that you have neither seen nor heard that you just are like, okay, 
I, I get it. It exists. People like it. It's it's weird. It's good. It, it's revolutionary. It, whatever. Just stop talking about it and tell me about the thing that happens next. Tell me about why it's important, not about the thing. Endless, endless, endless descriptions of the thing. And said tortured artist inexplicably kills her husband after shooting him in the face very, very many times. And... <sighs> Can we just take a second for the physical impossibility of shooting somebody in the face five times at close range with a rifle? Because, like, they ain't gonna have a face no more, girl. Like, what was you aiming at? <sighs> anyway. And after she is found standing over her dead husband's body, she becomes mute. She never speaks again. And because of this, rather than being thrown in prison for the rest of her life, she is sent to a mental health treatment centre for people who are criminally criminally insane I guess and this is the story of the white straight man with a white straight savior complex who wants to save her essentially oh sorry I mean this is about a psychologist who for some mysterious reason transfers to her center specifically to treat her but not any of the other people who are there because they're all fat and greasy and ugly looking because they're not white and straight and skinny and you know potentially fuckable. Oh yeah, and also women don't get to have any kind of dialogue unless they're there to further the plot. All of that without the plot holes of, but how did you get personal access to this patient all of these times on your own? Did nobody kind of think it was a little bit creepy that you wanted one-on-one -on -one, like locked door sessions with this perfectly vulnerable patient? Where are the CCTV cameras in this place? And then the twist at the end is just like, I saw a thread on Twitter which was actually talking about the twists at the end of thrillers and as somebody who spends a lot of time in thrillers trying to not guess the twist, I don't want to know. If I can work it out then I, it's not a good twist as far as I'm concerned. I like to sit in blissful ignorance for as long as physically possible and then when I think I have it, I want you to prove me wrong that I don't have it. However, people were talking about the idea that if there had been no breadcrumbs laid whatsoever, if there was no physical way to guess the twist before the twist happened, then it also wasn't a good twist. And I kind of have to agree with that as well. Like, I don't want to see the twist. I definitely don't want to work it out too early. But also, if there is no physical way to work it out, then it's not a twist. It's just you writing yourself out of the corner that you wrote yourself into. So yeah, in case you can't guess, I'm not a fan. I don't like it, it can go away. No seriously, just go away. So for a top on my list, I have a book that I actually dragged into January with me and I didn't expect to still be reading it in January. I expected to get it done in December, but do you know what? Christmas season was busy this year, okay? It turns out that people like to shop quite late for like small business stuff and it's, it's very stressful very stressful so I ended up dragging this one into January with me and it blew me away and that book is A Caribbean Mystery by Agatha Christie this is the I want to say it's like 12 of 13 but I might be wrong I'll put it here future Leanne now hates past Leanne for saying that I'm gonna do that it's all the girl's thoughts it's all for the sake of your audience just accept it accept it and move on I actually dnf this earlier on in 2019 because I really hate it when Agatha Christie takes either Poirot or Miss Marple abroad for anything and it turns into like international spy mystery stuff I just I like Miss Marple and St Mary Mead okay I don't I, I like it when she visits friends in the countryside it's all right when she occasionally goes to London but other than that I just want her to be in St Mary Mead okay and she wasn't for this one she was in the freaking Caribbean and I just resented it from the minute that I walked into the book and I decided I didn't like it I made a judgment call so now I need to eat my words I mean I'm not gonna actually write them down and eat them because that seems dangerous given that I have a generalized like unexplained pain at the moment but you know I'm gonna I'm gonna metaphorically eat my words because this was great and the reason that I actually went back to read it was because the last book in the Miss Marple series Nemesis directly refers to this one and I couldn't remember who anybody was or why I should care and so I was like I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to just do it 
and it was fabulous so in this one Miss Marple's nephew Raymond the infamous Raymond he sends her on a Caribbean holiday probably thinking in his very Raymond way that this is likely to be the last sort of big hurrah holiday that Miss Marple gets and when she gets there she discovers that it's the same old crowd of very young things of unattached people trying to hook up and of people her age who are repeating the same stories over and over and over again and it turns out that one of those stories is about a murder and the person who tells it very quickly afterwards winds up dead. That person should not have told that story is all I am saying. It was just after the first couple of chapters where I just gave up on it, it was really surprisingly twisty turny. I love the way in the Miss Marple novels that because there's an internal chronology she gets more and more frail as the series goes on and so less able to do investigating herself in the traditional way that she used to do like you know hiding behind hedges and stuff and so she actually has to come up with other ways to find out the information that she wants and to manipulate people into doing things for her and it's it's great it's amazing I just would never I don't know I, I would never have thought that I would love a uh, senior character as much as I love Miss Marple and there's another senior character in this book who she ends up being quite good friends with who is a cantankerous old arse. He is a complete git, he just needs slapped several times with something heavy but the two of them together is just Agatha Christie can write dialogue like no other and you're just you're never going to convince me otherwise about it. I really really loved this one and did not expect to. So at this point in the video you guys are probably wondering but what about the books that lovely wife Helen actually set you for your TBR because so far the books that I've talked about have been ones that I added myself. So just to put you all out of your misery here's a little update. The first book that Helen sent me was Crisis 4 by Andy McNabb which is the second book in the Next Stone series and we're still reading this together and reading this aloud to her. It's a massive chunk of a book, like a huge chunk, but we're really enjoying it. One of the other books that I had was Crazy Rich Asians. I started this on audiobook and was really enjoying it until we got to the contemporary part of it and then I think the narrator just forgot that she was supposed to be narrating an audiobook. I don't know what exactly she thought that she was doing, but it, w it was not reading to me, that is for sure. So I uh, have paused this one because I'm going to swap to reading it on my Kindle at some later date and I'm carrying two other books on into February with me and that is The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. I'm still going to read it because I recognise guys that usually what I do if I don't get to a book by the end of a TBR is it just goes back on my shelf and eventually I will come back to it but I know that if I do not read this book now I am never coming back to it. I'm never coming back. I'm never going to read it. So I'm going to read it. And also Major Pettigrew's Last Stand, which I am listening to right now on audiobook and I am absolutely in love with. And the other two books are right here on this list. And unfortunately, the next book that I have is a bottom. And y'all are going to throw stones at me because so many of you were super, super excited to hear somebody on booktube talk about this book because they hadn't heard anybody else talk about it. And that is Clan of the Cave Bear by Jean M. All. Now, before you get mad at me, let me just start by saying the writing in this book is beautiful. It is sumptuous, it is lush, it is detailed, it's just that there's a hell of a lot of it. And that ended up being my problem. I listened to a good two and a half hours of this audiobook, of which the audiobook is 20 hours long. And I, do, I, I know a lot about rocks now. Uh, and I know a lot about the vegetation uh, in Caveman Times. And I know a lot about what you can do with the vegetable stock after you've taken the vegetables out of cooking in the water, I know what you can do with that. I also know a lot about cooking methods in this time. Uh, I know a lot about the plants and what they looked like and moved like and smelt like and potentially what you could do with them. I know about how warm it is and how very cold it is sometimes too. But that's kind of all that I know and for like two and a half hours of audiobook 
I gave it a good go you guys I gave it a good freaking go but I just didn't care and again it's not the narrator it's not the author it's not the writing it's just that I don't care if it had been a subject that I was maybe a little bit more invested in I might have held on because the writing was honestly great but for two and a half hours I would have expected something to happen I mean something did happen but you know <laughs> in a negligible way like I would have expected more drama there would have been you know this was meant to be about uh, a girl who was taken in by a oh yeah I should probably tell you guys what it's about this is a book which is set in literally caveman times it's about a little girl who's caught up in an earthquake her family disappears and she is taken in by the other tribe as a very small girl the other tribe is much less advanced and has a lot less uh, social cues and words and capabilities and she is definitely the odd one out and thought to be quite ugly because she doesn't look like everybody else and so I guess there's a little bit of a sort of parable being drawn there with like modern day society and stuff like that but either way it just wasn't my jazz I tried it it just, it just it just wasn't great. I think this one is kind of the equivalent of when I gave lovely wife Helen The Secret History by Donna Tartt and she just kind of went but why? and I was like well I don't really know but it worked for me and she was like but why? Yeah, it's that. It's just, it's just very that. And finally, my last book for this Tops and Bottoms, my last top, is The Blade Itself by Joe Abercrombie. I've almost finished this one as we speak, but nothing that can happen, nothing that can happen is going to change how much I love this book. This is the first book in the First Law trilogy, and essentially it is about three completely different characters who all are tied together by a situation that none of them wanted to be in. They are very much thrown together by fate. So we have Inquisitor Glotka who is only in his 30s but whose body has been absolutely ravaged by torture and he has now been taken on as a torturer himself. We have got Logan Ninefingers who is basically like Wolverine from X-Men except with nine fingers, no claws and just even less manners if it could be possible and he is a barbarian who has lost everybody in his life, kind of like Wolverine and he is kind of uh, trying to find trying to find a purpose and oh does he find a purpose a purpose is kind of brought to him and then it is about Jezel who is in the army and he is a fencer and he is a lush and he is all about the women and he is very quickly outfoxed, very quickly outfoxed and put in his place and left wondering exactly what he's doing with his life several times over. And I just, I loved the juxtaposition of this like really epic fantasy setting but with these characters who traditionally we are meant to not really be rooting for, right? We're meant to kind of hate these characters a little bit because they're all like, they're just all morally slightly not okay. They're a little bit dirty. They're quite reprehensible in their actions occasionally. But I love that. I love the 3D-ness of these characters. I love that there's not a single one of them who you look at and you think, yup, I can, I can back you and be seen to do it in public. Kind of not. I love also the fact that because they've had so many things happen to them in their lives, it has shaped them and moulded them and they are not, repeat, not the type of people who you would necessarily be drawn to. There are just so many times that I laughed out loud during this. It picked my mood up so much, it carried me away to somewhere else and none of the other books on my list this month kind of did that. They didn't really take me out of myself and that's what I'm looking for right now in a novel. I feel like I spend a lot of time in my head right now and I would like to be elsewhere and so this one really did the job. Also the audiobook narrator is freaking, he's amazing. If you get a chance to pick this up on audiobook please do. Some of, <laughs> some of the accents and the voices that he does are just they bring this book to life in very much the same way that Cobna Holbrook Smith 
brings the Rivers of London books to life on audiobook and I just won't I will never just read them anymore ever I have to re-listen to them because they're just they're amazing so yes that that is my final top I very much am looking forward to reading the rest of the series in the coming months. So that was my tops and bottoms for January and my mental health check-in. As always, if you have read any of the books that I have talked about and you either agree or disagree with me, or you know, you would like to pick up one of the books that I've talked about now because I've raved about it and you're just sick of listening to me, please tell me all of that in the comment section. And as always, my comment section is a safe place if you would like to talk about your mental health journey in January or you would like to talk about your experiences of any kind of chronic illness which has affected your mental health then please please do it and please feel free to talk to each other. As I said my banny finger is right here there will be no hate comments allowed. And I will be back very very soon with a new torture TBR. I think that's I'm gonna have to trademark that torture TBR. I'm going to come back with another one very soon for February and uh, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna very bitchily unhaul some books and probably talk about my worst books of 2019 because it's traditional for me to do all of the January videos in February. Just accept it as who I am as a person. Okay bye. Why is it so dark in here? <laughs> like my soul.